Welcome. My name is Celeste Fraser. I am on the board of both the Wandering Wildlife Society, which is the Estes Valley Watershed Coalition, as well as the Estes Park Garden Club. We are co hosting this talk this morning on pollinators. So, pardon our confusion. We've just um, inherited a new piece of equipment that is <clears throat> called the owl. You can see it right there. And what it does is uh, it, it swerves around and follows people who talk. So, the people at home who are watching will be able to see and hear all of you. And the Wandering, the Wandering Wildlife Society uh, uh, has monthly talks. Next month is about uh, bighorn sheep. And that is September 12th, I think. So join us. It'll be right in here. I believe it's going to be from 6 to 7 at night. Um, so look for our programs in the paper or online. And the our parent uh, organization, Estes Valley Watershed Coalition, we're the group that restored the whole valley after the 2013 flood. We're still at it today, planting, weeding, um, and more importantly, fire mitigation. So we're working on forest health. Um, and the person doing that is Willen right there for Miller. <laughs> she's muddy. She's just come in from the field. So uh, she's our, our top um, guru in the field. <laughs> anyway, today we have Calais Thomas. She just got married. Her name she's going by is her maiden name, I think, right? Uh, Thomas is my maiden name. Oh. Lejeune will be my new name. Lejeune. Calais Lejeune from the Butterfly Pavilion. She's going to talk to us about pollinators and what kinds of plants to grow in order to attract pollinators. Okay, take it away, Calais. Well, thank you all so much for letting me visit you today. We'll see if I can move this a little bit. A little better. I insisted on not holding my Perfect. Well, as uh, as introduced, I am Halle Lejeune. I am an educator from Butterfly Pavilion. So I'm very excited to be with all of you here today. Um, I will get started a little bit about Butterfly Pavilion first and some of the things we do, and then we will definitely be diving into this pollinator gardening and thinking about those wonderful little visitors we all who come to our garden. So in case you haven't heard of us, Butterfly Pavilion is an invertebrate zoo. So out of curiosity, how many of you have the chance to visit Butterfly Pavilion before? Awesome. Yeah. Hey. So we do like to show off certain types of animals. We're not your typical zoo, right? Because um, you and animals like lions, tigers, bears, they are vertebrates. So they have a backbone, they have bones. But all of the animals we like to talk about and show off are invertebrates. So they're animals that don't have that. And part of why we love to talk about them is we actually have a lot to choose from. Um, they make up about 97% of the animal species in the world. So this includes things like octopuses, crabs, spiders, scorpions, centipedes, millipedes, all the insects we're going to talk about today, all kinds of things. Um, and they very much outnumber animals that do have that. Growth. So animals like us, dogs, cats, fish, birds, reptiles, all those vertebrates, really only make up about 3% of the world's animal species. So we have a lot of really unique, diverse animals to choose from for our zoo. And on top of that, we just think that they are really amazing, really important animals that we want to share with everybody. So I have a few examples up here today. Of course, we are going to be focusing a little bit more on that center image there on some butterflies and other things that are considered pollinators. So of course have a great importance to us, um, not just as insects as part of their ecosystems, but they are also um, amazing at pollinating and helping us produce more of the plants that we love to see in our gardens. 
They're important for crop pollination, giving us all those food uh, produce options that we love. And even some things we don't always think about, like cotton is pollinated by things like bees and other insects. So things that make our clothes um, can be really important to us and are produced by these animals. So lots to think about with those guys. We are gonna get into quite a few things today. Um, we're gonna learn to identify some native pollinators and what they might be looking for in a garden. We're also gonna get some helpful tips on building low water native pollinator gardens. And then we're also gonna have plenty of time to answer questions that you may have about supporting pollinators. Um, I am also the kind of person who does not mind questions at all at any point throughout the program, so don't feel like you have to save it to the end. Um, and definitely, if we're keeping an eye on that Zoom chat for me, um, definitely put your questions there as well. I'd love to answer those for all of you too. So definitely love questions. Feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, but we are going to get started thinking about our pollinators and what type of pollinators we may expect. And it's really not just bees and butterflies. Those are the big kind of showy ones that we see all the time. And definitely bees, if we look over here, they make up almost 50% of the pollinators that we find. So they are a very important group. And that's not just bees, it also includes bugs related to them. So wasps, other things we may not always want to see in our garden, but are still really important to have there. And what I think is fascinating is that actually the second largest group there includes flies. So things that we maybe aren't always excited to see, but are still really important to producing more plants for our garden, getting those seeds and continuing pollination of lots of beautiful flowers. Um, also followed by flies, we have beetles. Uh, beetles are actually the most numerous group of insects um, that we know of so far. Some people are starting to think wasps might actually outnumber beetles. Um, but as far as we know, there's about like 400,000 species of beetles in the world, and there are definitely a huge chunk of those um, that are pollinators and very important to us. Then at about 10% of pollinators, we have butterflies and moths. So some of the biggest, showiest pollinators, um, they are in one of the smaller groups, but that doesn't make them any less important and wonderful to see in our garden. So we will definitely talk about them today. Um, you'll notice there's also a small little sliver of other pollinators. Those often include animals like bats, hummingbirds, other types of birds, um, even things like humans or larger mammals can be pollinators too. Uh, often by accident, um, but they do still have to have their purpose there. Um, we are gonna go through each of these groups, um, kind of one by one, and I'll um, talk about um, some of the native pollinators you might see in those different groups. We'll also think about what each group um, really is looking for in a garden, and we will see several plant recommendations pop up. And all of the plant recommendations that I have for you today actually come from um, two main sources that I will share um, again at the end as well, so you can look these up later and keep them in mind, they're excellent. Uh, the first one is the Low Water Native Plants for Colorado Gardens, um, published by the Colorado Native Plant Society, with help from a lot of other organizations like Butterfly Pavilion. Um, and this is a great resource. Um, specifically, this one is for um, high elevation plants, so definitely um, for the Essex Valley area and surrounding areas here. Um, a great resource for plants that will be good at this ele uh, elevation. And then we also have selecting plants for pollinators, a regional guide for farmers, land managers, and gardeners in the southern Rocky Mountain set. Um, so this is one that is a really great resource for the kind of region that we are in. Um, if you go to their website, pollinator.org slash guide, um, you can actually type in any zip code in some parts of the US and Canada, and it will bring up a guide for that area. So even if you have relatives that live in other states who are also interested in getting into pollinator gardens, they can definitely use this resource to find some things that will be more relevant to them. Um, so it's a great resource for native plants, but it also provides that kind of crossover of native plants that are amazing for nectar feeders and pollinators and host plants or butterflies that we'll kind of get into a little later. So uh, if you're using both of them, um, I actually, to prepare for this, just kind of cross-reference the plants that are listed in both. Um, and those are some of the ones that I've highlighted today. So um, it'll, it's a great resource for getting kind of both those ideas in there. Any questions so far before we get into the comments? Cool. 
quick drink of water if I talk too fast. Help me slow down. <laughs> um, so the first group we're going to talk about is, of course, that really large group of pollinators, E, kind of space of pollination uh, bees. And when they are visiting a garden, they are going to have some flower preferences. For colors, they're mostly looking for whites, yellows, blues. They also can see UV, so some more like ultraviolet colors, which means that often flowers will look very different to them when they look to us. And this often includes like little tracks that kind of show them where the nectar is, helping guide them to those nice nectar places where they'll also pick up some pollen. Um, so that is the other part of these plants. The flowers they visit usually have an abundance of nectar. So that is kind of their reward for visiting the flower and getting pollen attached to themselves is that they then get that nice um, nectar, which they will um, sometimes bring back to their hive to use for honey. It's also just part of what they eat for themselves. And then their flower shapes are usually going to be kind of shallow and tubular. So you kind of see, especially like these ones, how they have that tube towards the center. That's really what these bees are going to be looking for. So for um, this elevation, um, what you're really going to be looking for for bees are penstemon species, um, specifically Rocky Mountain penstemon, penstemon stryptus. It's an excellent um, bee attracting plant. They have beautiful purple flowers that bloom in the springtime. And they do require full sun, um, but they also may attract hummingbirds. And I also kind of saw something that they are deer resistant. So I figured that might be a very big deal for this crowd, right? Um, and I wasn't able to find out information on some of my other ones. So definitely a nice addition to any garden up here. Um, and the other consideration you want for your gardens and when thinking about bees that are visiting is shelter. So there are all kinds of bees in the world. We're going to get into a few different groups of them in a moment. Um, but they do require shelter spaces in order to survive. And this might be um, something like a tree or a shrub where they can build a hive in. So especially for those honeybees that build really large hives, they need a stronger structure to kind of attach that to and build it off of. Um, but for smaller bees who are going to live more by themselves, they're really looking for just a small nest. Um, so this can be accomplished through bee boxes like this one um, that a volunteer built for our site. Um, these basically just include um, some kind of wood with some kind of like little tubular holes. I've never seen people build these out of like a can that they stuck a bunch of straws in just to have something that is like a cozy little home for a singular bee. Um, if you are looking for a more natural look for your garden, you can also accomplish this just by a large log that you drill holes in of various sizes. So it'll be an excellent little home for any of those solitary bees that are traveling. Um, bees sometimes are also nesting or ground digging species. So we'll build their nests and hives in the ground. So in your garden, if you have spaces that are uncovered and just soil um, without everything being covered, um, those are great opportunities for those ground nest species to build their little homes and hives um, in order to find some shelter. And as I said, there are a lot of different types of bees. The main one that people really think of when they hear the word bee is going to be the honeybee. Um, these are actually non-native species. So um, when people started moving to the Americas, they actually brought honeybees over with them because they are such excellent um, pollinators, they help farmers out so much, so they were brought over to continue that in the new world. Um, so even though all of the populations here have been here for ages and ages, um, they are considered non-native because they are not originally from the Americas. Um, so there are benefits to that, of course, since they are so good at pollinating and such great additions to farms. Um, they are big helpers in making sure all the produce that's produced in the uh, United States actually gets produced. Um, but it also means that they might not always be as in tune with the native plants that are in the area. So just keep that in mind as you have native plants in your garden. Sometimes they're not the best for honeybees themselves, um, but they're also not very picky. So if there are honeybees in the area, they'll generally find their way to some of these flowers. On the other hand, things like uncle bees um, do have a lot of native species um, in Colorado and in the United States. I think there's something like um, 250 species in 
that might be total, but about 40 that are native to the US. Um, and for Colorado in this area, you might see the Hunts bumblebee, or the Northern bumblebee, Central bumblebee, two-form bumblebee, white shoulder bumblebee. Um, these are super helpful in the sense they are native to this area. They are used to the native plants in this area. So they're often some of the first bees to emerge in the springtime to get some of those early spring flowers. And they'll be some of the last bees to go into hibernation in the fall as they um, are used to when the fall flowers are blooming. These are often going to be ground nesting species. So bumblebees, if you're looking for them in your garden, you're going to want them to have a space to build that nest in the ground. Um, and they are also not amazing honey producers. So there's a reason we always get our honey from honeybees. Um, honeybees just kind of produce way too much of it. They have just our little honey factories that are often overflowing with honey. Whereas bumblebees really only produce enough honey for themselves in their hive. Um, so most of the time, if you are getting honey, it's going to be from a honeybee as opposed to a bumblebee. Yeah. Do the bees <clears throat> stay throughout the winter, or do they hibernate, or what do they do? Yeah, it really probably depends on the species. Most bees are going to stay through the winter, but they might not always stay in the same form that we expect. Um, so like <laughs> butterflies. Um, bees go through complete metamorphosis where they start as a larva, they have a pupa stage like this was our cocoon, and then they emerge as adults. Um, so for a lot of these insects that we'll talk about today, um, a lot of times they will stay the winter just in a different stage where they don't need it to be as warm to move around, or when they'll dig down, lay their eggs deep in the soil where they're protected for the winter, and then they'll overwinter as an egg or as a pupa and something like that. And then our last group of bees we'll consider are these solitary bees. So there are about 950 species of solitary bee in Colorado. <laughs> That's not from the United States. Um, and they just have so many um, different colors. There's different groups of them. I didn't even list individual species, partially because they're not as well studied. So it's harder to know what is in this area. Um, but there are general groups of them, like digger bees, which will be those ground nesting bees. Mason bees and carpenter bees, which will um, kind of build their homes a little bit, but they are going to be not quite high, it's more of those little nests, like in a bee box or something that you might find, um, and sweat bees, which often come in just a rainbow of colors. Um, so they are a very interesting group. And a lot of them are actually more picky eaters than other bee species. Um, honeybees and bumblebees tend to be generalist pollinators, so they'll visit all kinds of flowers as long as they have good nectar. Um, but a lot of solitary bees have very specific relationships with certain wildflowers or certain groups of wildflowers. Um, a prime example is the alfalfa leaf cutter bee is a solitary bee, and they only go to alfalfa plants. So they're very useful for uh, pollinating at alfalfa, which would be for feeding a lot of cows and a lot of livestock that we rely on. So um, a lot of their relationships are very specific. And if you are looking for a specific solitary bee in your garden, sometimes that means tracking down a very specific type of plant. Um, but as I said, a lot of that is still studied, so it's harder to find exactly which ones you will need. Um, but sometimes that can also be accomplished a little, a little later um, just by going to a nearby park or visiting a neighbor's garden and seeing what is actually visiting already established clubs. So, um, the next group we'll talk about, one of my personal favorites, um, are eagles. Um, and this is one of those groups that people don't expect to see when you talk about pollinators. Um, but they are um, definitely very numerous, very important group of pollinators. Um, when they are visiting gardens, a lot of the flowers they prefer are going to be more white or green. Um, sometimes they will have nectar in them, but usually they're going to have more abundant pollen because these species of beetles are typically going to eat pollen more often. And that's actually part of why they are great pollinators because when they are in the flower, digging around, trying to eat as much pollen as possible, they're also very messy eaters. So that pollen will just stick all over their body. And as they kind of like waddle over to the next flower, it'll 
redistribute in there as well as they're looking for their next policy piece. So um, they are going to be looking for more larger or bowl like flowers, or at least something that's grouped kind of like these that will support their weight. Um, and that's part of um, them being those messy eaters. They're going to be often totally in the flower, just eating all the pollen they can. <laughs> Um, so there is a good flower recommendation for these guys up here. Um, the Achillea, Achillea species. So these are going to be types of yarrow um, or yarrow. Um, specifically, the western yarrow is going to be good for this elevation. Um, this western yarrow is more of a white variety that will also bloom in spring. Um, this one is just partial sun, and it also may attract butterflies and flies. So good kind of all around um, pollinator attraction for your gardens, but also pretty good. Our next group we're going to think about, since beetles are another one where they're so numerous and so understudied, I could not find any specific species information for this area. So <laughs> such a struggle for such a big group. You should be able to find something, but that's part of why we're here. So you all can start helping us find more of them. <laughs> um, but we are also going to think about those flies um, and their flower preferences as well. Um, they are going to prefer more pale and dull colors or like dark brown or purple. Um, and they're not usually, again, looking for nectar. So they are also, if they are pollinating flies, probably eating pollen. Um, so they're looking for plants with a lot of pollen in abundance. And then yes, the other thing for flies is they are going to be attracted to really strong, really bad scents. Um, so it is kind of a strange thing to have in your garden, right? But variety is the spice of life. So um, keeping those in there will help keep some of the fly pollinators around as well. And they do have some, there are some beautiful flowers that are just awful smelling, but lovely for flies to visit. Um, so they're also going to be looking for more of a flat, shallow flower. And sometimes they will be more funnel shaped. Um, but they will also look for some of those broad surfaces to climb around on while they're there. Um, and this actually is a type of hover fly, which are super fun because they're little bee units. Um, so when I was finding them in the garden, I definitely, you have to pause for a moment and be like, is that a bee? Or is that? No, that's a fly. He's got the little like, mischievous hands with the great big eyes. Um, so doing a great job being a bee. But then for our recommendation for flies, um, we have the phacelium species. So for this elevation, you're looking for a silky phacelia. Um, and it's going to have Purple flowers, they're going to bloom in about midsummer. They do like their partial sun, and they're also going to attract bees. So, another kind of double layer with the sun. So, are there any questions about beetles and flies before I move on to probably our favorite sequence? Awesome. Well, then we will talk about our butterflies and. Oh, yeah, that's right. Just about eating the pollen. So, that's literally their food. Yeah, a lot of insect species that is like the only thing they'll eat is pollen. Um, some of them, like there are some beetle species that will eat pollen and other things like fruit or leaves and other parts. But yeah, they'll eat the pollen and then they're just such messy eaters about it. But extra pollen gets attached to them and gets dispersed. So that's partially why the plants that have developed that relationship with flies and beetles just produce an abundance of pollen because they're counting on some of it being lost. But the other side to that is some of it will get redistributed. Yeah. But, but bees <coughs> pack that um, pollen in their saddlebags. Yeah, so often bees are not going to be eating the pollen, um, or they might use it later in some of the like foods that they produce, yeah. um, like the royal jelly or things that they make for other members of the hive. Um, but that's part of why they're such great pollinators is because they almost collect the pollen by accident in the yeah. really well-developed um, pollen baskets, I think they call them, um, and then they get distributed as they're traveling to different flowers. Bumblebees are kind of the same way. Part of it, what makes them great pollinators is those really fluffy bodies, and they also do something called buzz pollination, which is where they literally, as they're like in the flower getting nectar, they just vibrate and like buzz their bodies, which basically shakes the pollen out of the flower and just dumps it all over their bodies. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different like really intricate ways that all these pollinators 
have developed in order to get what they need, which is either the nectar or pollen that they're using to eat or make food for others. Um, and then it's kind of like these plants have developed really tricky ways to like also take the pollen and go distribute it to my neighbor. Yeah, it's a bees take it back to the nest for all the other bees, right? But yeah, some of it will come back. Um, some of it will be lost as they're traveling to different flowers, but. Okay. We came up to Denver and you know we have the Japanese people yes. and they just eat all they, they yeah. Eat. They, yeah, those guys will eat everything. So that's kind of the double-edged sword of eagles is that some of them are very specific and some will like only eat pollen and some of them will just eat whatever they can find. The Japanese eagles? I am not really sure. Um I'm curious, has anyone experienced Japanese beetles in their gardens or parks in the yeah, Maybe they know. Um, but yeah, in, in Denver, they're all over the place. Um, I love going to the Denver Tan Gardens, and they just have so many of them. Uh, so we will talk about um, some pest control management tips a little later, too, when thinking about things like the Japanese beetles, which are a stunning beetle. I love looking at them, <laughs> but they're just awful. <laughs> I know my horticulturist, yeah, my horticulturist would just like hate me for saying that. I'm like, they're so pretty. <laughs> I love insects. What did they say? But yeah, they are just miserable. Um, so our next and kind of final group of pollinators is going to be butterflies and moths. I'll kind of think about their flower preferences again. In some ways, they are similar. So both butterflies and moths are looking for lots of nectar. They don't really care about the pollen aspect of the flower as much. Um, but they are going to have some differences in colors. Butterflies are going to really be looking for really bright colors, including like reds and purples, but also yellows, oranges, all kinds. Moths are going to be a little bit more of the pale colors, so like a pale or dull red, um, pale purples, pinks, whites, those kinds of things. Um, and then again, they are going to be a little different based on the smell. Butterflies will go for flowers that have very faint or fresh smells. Um, and moths tend to go for really strong smells, but smells that are emitted at night. So if you think of things like jasmine um, or those flowers that really just, their smells come to life at night, those will often be big attractors to moths. Uh, and then both of them are going for more of that tubular flower shape. They have those long proboscis um, mouth parts, which is what they use to drink the nectar. So they're looking for something that will um, accommodate them on for all of that tongue strong mouth part um, into the flower. And butterflies in particular tend to like to sit there while they're drinking. So they need something with a bit of a um, landing pad for them. So a couple of recommendations for these guys. Um, uh, Galarvia, I'm gonna mess up all of these species names, um, but blanket flower is another common name for this um, species. Um, they have yellow or orange blooms. I think they come in a lot of different varieties. Um, they bloom in spring. They are full sun, and these are ones that are going to be great for moths. So a beautiful addition to your garden for those nighttime dwellers. And then um, for butterflies, a great recommendation I have for this elevation is black eyed season. So um, a fairly well known flower, um, one that has yellow brown flowers, they bloom in the summer, they're going to be full sun, and they are great for the butterflies. So yeah, one of each of those moths and butterflies are important. <clears throat> now, something else we're going to have to think about for our butterflies um, is what they're going to eat at all stages of their lives. So adult butterflies are really looking for nectar plants. Like some of our bees, they're not going to be very picky as long as it has abundant nectar. Um, and some of those other small preferences I've mentioned, they'll be pretty happy. But their babies are very picky eaters. So most, especially butterfly species, are only going to eat one or a few different types of plants, maybe like a whole family of plants. Um, but other than that, they won't eat anything. So if you've heard of like monarchs and milkweed, that's kind of the relationship there. Monarchs have to lay their eggs on milkweed, otherwise their caterpillars won't eat. Um, so that's what we consider their host plant, it is what the caterpillar lives on, it's, it's, the, it's the caterpillar shelter. It's going to be the food for the caterpillar as it grows. And there are a few butterflies and moths 
um, I kind of found that live in this area and have host plants that can grow in this area. Um, so the first one is the Wide Myers Admiral. They're really going to be into willows and cottonwoods. Um, Quaking aspen is a great plant that will grow in this area that they will lay their eggs on. Uh, there's another one we'll get to in a bit, but we'll do the same thing with Quaking aspen or other willows and cottonwood. The orange sulfur has a few, a little variety of plants that will accommodate its caterpillars. Um, but for this area, you're going to be looking for some loco weed species and some pine species. The morning cloak is the other one that will do willows and cottonwood. So quaking aspen and then great for the morning cloak. Um, the bottom one here is a white lined sphinx moth. Moths tend to be a little less picky about what they'll eat as they use. Um, but like this moth is a little bit more specific to wild buckwheat, um, chickweeds, and those other things. I think the wild buckwheat is the one that's really great for this area. And then our last one there is the checkered white. And they will basically only eat as babies crucifers and Rocky Mountain bee plant. And Rocky Mountain bee plant is a great one here. So to kind of list those out for all of those butterflies, um, those are really the host plants that you're looking at that will grow in this area and help house baby caterpillars, baby butterflies as they're growing up. Um, so I can always bring this up a little later too, or if you're growing a picture. I'll just Are there any questions about butterflies? I think that was the last thing for them. So I think we have about a little more specific about those guys before I move on to our kind of tips for building out this garden. We now have wonderful plant ideas for. Yeah. So are monarch species uh, found in this area? They are found in Colorado. Um, I think milkweed. Um, I wasn't really finding anything that said milkweed wouldn't grow up here. Um, but if you, yeah, if you had experience with it, then absolutely. Um, but um, yeah, just you get any confirmation anywhere that it does. So from personal experience, if you grow milkweed up here, it's awesome. Um, I don't know that they will travel up here as much, um, and especially in Colorado, um, as years have gone by, their migration has moved more and more like eastern. So we don't get hardly any. We might every once in a while get over the year year where we have like an increase there in insects. So their populations seem to just kind of like grow and shrink at the turn of a dime. Um, but yeah, we in Denver, like around Butterfly Pavilion, I think we usually see like two or three of them every year. Um, so it really is kind of hit or miss with them, but we get very scattered, scattered monarchs. We have a lot of monarchs from the oh, excuse me. I go through through northeast Nebraska. Yeah. In fact, my uh, sister takes them. Oh yeah. Those in all four generations. Oh, that's awesome. She's been to the butterfly reserve in Mexico and they did find two of hers that's that so cool. never take. Wow. Which is yes. I love hearing that story. But that's they're so on the endangered list now, as you know. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. um Actually, you see in northeast Nebraska is milkweed, 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 and no. But you know, for farmers, milkweed is not a good thing. Jim spent hours all I was gonna say, I mean, there's probably a reason it has weed in it. But it's people are starting to educate to buy in. Yeah, she's she's got a lot of too. Well, they interfere with the corn and the soybeans and they take yeah, the water. They take the water. Oh, so yeah. you can chop them out. Yeah. <laughs> that's the purpose of chopping them out. That's what you have to eat. Man, a good smother. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. And yeah, um, I love that you brought up that endangered um, listing. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of good in some ways and unfortunate in some ways because it's just listed, they're listed as endangered on the IUCN red list which doesn't actually help dictate policies or changes for us. So they're not listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act in the United States, which means they don't get the protections. Um, and I think that was recently determined, like in the past couple of years, they like looked at monarchs and then said, um, what is it? Like they probably should be included on this list, 
but we're not going to because we have more important species or something that we're going to focus on. So there's that. And then they were going to look at it again, I think, next year or 2024. So they kind of do it on like every couple of years, they'll revisit some of the species they haven't included and take another look. So maybe they're being listed on the IUCN rec list now will give a little extra push the next time they come up. Um, and it is good in some ways because it does, even though the IUCN rec list doesn't really provide any of those protections, it does raise awareness and it does mean that now people are like, oh, wow, we're starting to really think about this and consider them to be endangered and important enough to think about it. There's just very few monarchs or swallowtails is here. I mean, no. when, they, when the monarchs went through our area, trees were just heavy with monarchs, with thousands and thousands of monarchs. And, and this year, I don't know, because uh, Julie, you know, keeps on the lookout for all these butterflies. She's on the monarch flyway and, and there's just, None. Yeah. And part of its temperature. Yes. I thought I would yeah. up that um, I read recently in the outline too where they yeah. changed the migration. Oh, yeah. And, and that, that was fascinating to me because we have all these trees in that collection, but we also have milkweed. It takes a lot of water. I tried to grow it in the Island Springs, the desert. It does not grow. Yeah. And that's probably also why I don't have any milkweed recommendations up here because I'm just looking for blue water. So, you can send oh, away to was it Live Live Monarch Foundation and South South Address Envelope, and they would send you milkweed seeds for appropriate area. for your area. So awesome. I have yet to get any, <laughs> but, but we're hoping that they show up because there's several different kinds of milkweed. Oh, anyway. Well, the blood of the swell has a beautiful display in their garden some sculpture mm -hmm. with these glove milkweeds. Have you seen the glove of milkweeds that are green? I'd go there just to see that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's in the blood of the swell where they have palms. Oh, yeah. It's in the park. They have mm -hmm. sculptures in there. It's just lovely. All right, well, I will go ahead and move on to our pollinator garden building tips. Um, again, we will probably have time at the end to discuss questions and other things further, but I will have some tips for um, other ways to help pollinators, including some monarchs, a little later. So uh, we will definitely get to that. But as you are considering building your pollinator garden, there are a few things you're going to have to keep in mind. We're going to go through each of these categories and give some tips for each of them, but we are going to be thinking about inventory, design, plant selection, and maintenance. Those are going to be our four main things um, to keep in mind as we are considering our gardens and our spaces. So the first one is going to be inventory, especially thinking about our landscape. So if you are building a pollinator garden or you have a space in mind, what you're wanting to do first thing is get an inventory of what you have available, right? So you're gonna to wanna to look at your soil. What kind of soil is in your space? Is it heavy clay? Is it more sandy? Um, if you aren't sure, there are some um, experts who can come out and do a soil test for you um, and let you know kind of what you're looking at. Um, there are some plants that need more drainage than others. You don't water than others, right? So um, thinking about what kind of soil will help out as you're trying to establish um, plants in your space. Um, along with that, of course, is water. How are you planning to water the garden? Do you already have an irrigation system set up? Is that something you're wanting to add? So if you need space to add that. Um, it's also important to keep in mind, even though a lot of my recommendations are low water, especially as you are establishing a garden and trying to get those plants rooted and there for the long run, um, you will need to water them frequently to get them established. So keeping that in mind too factoring that into your plans in your day um, as you think about how much time you're spending caring for them. And then you're also going to want to do an inventory of the light and shelter in your garden. And so this is um, probably a fairly big time commitment because you want to be able to catch different times of day. See, you know, in the morning, where's the sun shining? Um, in the late morning, where's the sun shining? In the afternoon, where's the shining? Right? All throughout the day, um, are there certain spots of your garden 
that get more sun than others? Are there areas um, where it's like half the day they get sun, half the day they don't? Um, and keep in mind that no matter what um, the plants want, um, pollinators are also gonna love sunspots. So making sure you have at least a couple places where you can take advantage of the sun, whether it's in a sheltering plant for a pollinator who may need the sun to warm them up so they get ready to go for the day, um, or in an area where they may be getting water or some of the food that they need. Um, keeping that in mind too, that they will need those sunny spots just as much as some of your plants. The other part of inventory is thinking about how you're going to use your space. So thinking about the existing elements, what is already in your space? Are you going to have to like do a complete overhaul the way you have, or is what you're looking for right now just adding a couple good pollinator plants, right? Um, so what do you already have there um, that you have to either remove or kind of refigure as you're building your pollinator garden? Um, you also want to think about the care, right? How much time or effort do you have to put into caring for a garden? How much time do you want to put into it, right? Um, the pollinator garden should be something that you enjoy doing. You should hopefully not feel like a chore um, because otherwise it's going to be hard to get yourself to do it all the time, right? And to that point, enjoyment, right? What would help you spend more time in your garden? So if you're building your design, do you need to add a little walking path? Do you need to factor in where to put a bench or do you just sit to enjoy the garden, right? Um, because if you build the garden and you don't spend a lot of time in it, you might not be able to see as much when something is going wrong in the garden. So it should be a place that you also enjoy being in and enjoy hanging out. Um, the other part of inventory is Knowing your pollinators, right? We talked a lot about this already, so I won't go too much into it. Um, but my knowledge about where pollinators are can only go so far, right? What's really going to help you is knowing what is in your area, what is near your personal home, right? So this might include going to a park that's nearby your home or going to a neighbor's house um, and seeing what visits their garden or what's the, what visits the flowers that are already in your area, right? Because there is a certain element of build it and they would come, they'll, they'll come, right? But there's also this element that you should be expecting some things that are already in your area. And you don't have to be like the greatest identifier in the world to be able to do this, right? Often simply saying, oh, that's a bee, or that's a fly, that's a butterfly, right? That can help you kind of get an understanding of what you will actually see in your area. Um, for identification, the most helpful thing for these animals is going to be looking at their main shapes and their colors. So if you don't notice anything else about the animal, but kind of what that wing looked like, it's going to get you a long way. Um, for bumblebees in particular, I'll have a resource I'll share at the end that is excellent because you can often tell species of bumblebees apart by the bands and like the colors and patterns of the bands on their body. So that's another excellent way to keep that. So once you've taken your inventory, you know your space, what you are working with, with soil and water, what your pollinators you might be looking at in the area are. You can get to, and I'm sure many people consider the fun part, yeah. design, right? So this is actually an example of a design that came from the Low Water Native Plants resource. And we'll kind of use it as our example for things that you want to be thinking about as you are building your garden. So first you're going to want to think about right plant, right place, right? Taking that inventory into what kind of soil you have, uh, what kind of water you're getting, how you're watering, what kind of sun you're getting. That's how you'll know what plants are going to be appropriate for the space you already have, right? So if you're looking for um, the like low um, sun plants, right? We talked about some of those early, like the penstemons are going to be more full sun, um, but that yarrow that we discussed is going to be more partial sun. So making sure that you know what is already happening in that space will help you do this part of design. You can choose which parts are gonna get partial sun plants, which parts are gonna get full sun. If you have plants that prefer sandy soil and you have a section of your garden that's sandy soil, benching in that area is gonna be very important. You also wanna think about layers. So we talked about this importance for like bees especially, right? As they may need 
larger, stronger plants to build hives on. Butterflies are kind of the same way. Butterfly houses that people make don't often work because butterflies really would prefer the shelter of like a tree or a shrub. So building layers into your garden is what's going to allow for more um, use for pollinators. They're gonna get more out of it. They're gonna find shelter in some areas. Um, the other thing building layers does, so in our example here, um, we've got a lot of our shrubs on the edges here. Um, shrubs and trees can act as a windbreak for the rest of your garden. So it can make it more of a safe haven for our smaller plants who are gonna be affected by large gusts of winds or even a light breeze sometimes, right? Um, so designing it so your shrubs are placed in the wind, the direction of the wind that would be coming in can help protect the area for your pollinators. And then you're also going to want to design it for foraging efficiency. So what I mean by this is you'll notice on our design, whenever we have certain plants in an area, um, they're all kind of merged together, right? So number 12 here is the sulfur buckwheat. There's a lot of little plants grouped together there. Also, shrubs are great easy ways to put all of the type of plant together. The reason you're going to want to do this is because pollinators can be a little bit lazy, right? They spend a lot of energy flying around. So they want to make sure that when they land somewhere, it's not going to be a waste of their time. They're going to get all that nectar and energy that they need back. So planting a bunch of the same type together is really going to encourage pollinators to visit that spot so they can hop to a bunch of the same plants at the same time. Um, and that's why shrubs are great because they have a huge area of flowers that can be produced and be attracting pollinators. And why when you see a lot of these different types of plants that are included in the design, they're all kind of grouped together. Our next session is thinking about plant selection. And I know we've talked about this a bit, but thinking about it from the perspective of why we, why we select some of those plants. Um, we have talked a bit about native plants. Um, a lot of my recommendations are native plants. And there's sometimes, you know, you can incorporate non-native plants into your garden. You do want to be careful of invasive species and being aware of what plants really should be planted or they'll take over. Um, but the reason we focus on native plants is because they're the ones that are going to have the best relationships with the native pollinators and other native animals that are already here, right? Um, so it'll help make your garden um, more of a safe haven for those insects that are already going to exist here. And it's also going to make it, of course, unique and very, um, like, you know, you're not going to find a Colorado garden in California, right? So it very much sets apart your garden as being uniquely called up. Okay. Um, the other thing you'll want to think about for plant selection is that idea that um, we, these animals have complex life cycles. So we are not just thinking about the adult pollinators that come to visit, right? Even though those are the ones we see the most, it's the butterflies and the adult bees that come to visit. But we're also trying to create a place for all aspects of their life cycle. So this includes planting some of those host plants for the caterpillars to eat. This includes um, sometimes including like soft stem shrubs that those solitary bees can dig into if you're unable to provide like a little bee house. Um, this might mean, again, leaving some open spaces so beetles can dig down in the dirt and lay their eggs and have their babies stay safe in the ground, right? Um, so you're going to be looking for all aspects of their life cycles as well and can help them there. Um, the big thing to remember about this is if you are planting host plants, they will get eaten and that's okay. Um, part of the point is that they'll get eaten. And so, and a lot of it, caterpillars are voracious eaters. So if you are using host plants, you want to plant a lot of them um, in order to sustain those hungry, hungry caterpillars. Um, and then the other thing we're going to talk about is variety. So when I say variety, I really mean all of it. Different colored flowers, different smelling flowers, different shapes of flowers, right? Um, the other thing we'll think about with variety, if we revisit our design here, is different blooming seasons, right? In order to maximize the pollinators in the area, we have to maximize what flowers are blooming when. 
So in the springtime, you may see choke cherry or golden currant, right? Those are going to be some growth blooming. And you'll even see in my spring ones, there's variety in the spring plants, right? We have white flowers, there's yellow flowers, there's bowl like purple flowers, there's tubular yellow flowers, right? There's a lot of variety, even just in my springtime flowers. Um, the other thing I kind of want to point out is in order to make your garden visually appealing, you'll want to kind of space out some of the different blooming. Um, if they all bloom at the same time of year, space them out in your garden. You're getting at. So like the choke cherry is right here, right? But then we put the golden currant over here. And then we have number 14, the plumus penstemon right down here. So it's spread out in the garden. So as you're looking across your garden in the springtime, it's not all just all flowers in one little corner. It's spread out around the whole garden, even if not everything is blooming at the same time. For summer, especially in this area, you get a lot of options. <laughs> um, basically, all but two of these will bloom in the summer. Um, and then I know, especially for higher elevations, fall is kind of hit or miss, right? So you might get a few before the first snowfall. Um, but yeah, as much as you can add some of that seasonal variety into your garden. And it's an important thing to think about too, even though we have all of these are summer plants, right? It might be kind of different times of summer, right? They might bloom early summer versus mid-summer versus late summer. So even in the summer ones, there's a variety of when they're going to be blooming. So that's important to keep in mind too. Um, for the other resource I showed you, the selecting plants for pollinators, they actually have a great breakdown of what's blooming what time of year and kind of gives you a breakdown of those colors as well. So you can have some of that variety. So um, this is a little difficult because some of these, it's a very wide region of Colorado that this particular guide supports. So some of these might not be the best for this elevation, um, but it will give you some options and then you can kind of compare them to the timeline through the year of what's blooming in spring, what's blooming in June versus August, um, and things like that. Have any questions about variety of plants? Red bear and Valisa. I know there's some really interesting names in the yeah. antelope that are bush. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know what that is. I don't know what it is either. Mm, uh, this, almost all of these are pretty common. Yeah, are they? Up here, yeah. Uh, the twin berries up at Lily Lake. Um, yeah, they're, oh, they're all over. So part of it too, some of them may be good for this area, but the reference I cross-referenced them with was a low water high elevation. So it may be that some of these are really good for this elevation. They just require a little more water, but yeah. Yes, and then like I said, you guys will know this area better than I ever will. Um, so thank you for adding the, the twin berry honeysuckles in this area. Yeah, all of them, the nine bar, the bitter brush is all over. Awesome. I'm not sure that it's very current, but the rabbit brush. And I think there are some current species. That's yeah, really there's a couple, but the <laughs> wax current and the yellow yeah. current. And the bears look gooseberry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know of any bear resistant and with <laughs> I found a couple deer resistant ones. But. <laughs> so then the last category we kind of think about as we're building that pollinator garden is the maintenance and how we're going to maintain this garden throughout the year. Um, the biggest one is that yeah, there are going to be pests in our gardens. It's kind of unavoidable. But one thing we can avoid is pesticides, um, partially because a lot of the Pesticides are aimed at killing insects. And it just so happens there are also some good insects that want to live in your garden. That's the whole point of the pollinator garden, right? So, in using certain pesticides, especially I think neonicotinoids are the ones we want to avoid. Um, they, yeah, they will get rid of the bad insects you don't want, right? But they're also going to get rid of bees and butterflies and things. So, there are some things you can do to introduce more of like natural pesticides. So my favorite solution is releasing ladybugs or praying mantises or spiders into your gardens, right? Um, some hardware stores have even started selling like little colonies of ladybugs lately. So especially if you have a big aphid problem, release a few dozen ladybugs in your garden and they'll pick them right up. 
Um, the other thing you can do is just use like a soapy water solution to kind of clean the plants with. Um, and then also um, removing pests by hand often is a great way to really specifically target things that you don't want in your garden while leaving it a safe place for some of those things you do want to attract. Uh, it's kind of a basic tip, but making sure that you're cleaning your tools after using them. Um, sanitation is really important for making sure that we don't spread disease in our garden. So if, like one plant that you've been working on has developed a disease, um, if you're not cleaning your tools, you can potentially spread that to other parts of your garden. So it's a very simple um, tip that can have a big impact on your garden as well. And we kind of talked about this already, right? <laughs> some weeds, especially in some areas, as opposed to others, are actually good to have around. Um, I will, at the end, I'll show you the website for the Colorado Noxious Weeds list. So if you familiar yourself with those weeds and the ones you don't want to have, you can make sure that some of the weeds that are really just honestly native quality or plants, right? Um, you can keep around some of those good ones while removing the ones that are going to be detrimental to other things in your garden growing or um, that might attract some things that you don't want in your garden. Um, you also want to make sure you time maintenance in your garden so that it doesn't interfere with pollinator life cycles. I've mentioned a lot already, right? That pollinators don't always look the same. And they don't always are they aren't always that big picture as butterfly and Sometimes they're a little tiny grub who's living in the ground, right? Um, and one of the biggest things you can do to help preserve their life cycle is leaving your dead plants during the fall and winter, right? They provide great shelter for the animals that are using them to hide from the snows and to have a safe place during a really hard time of year, right? So if you can wait until like March or April to start removing some of those things, um, that'll be a big help to those baby insects, especially. Um, the exception being, of course, if you have something that is diseased in your garden, you definitely want to remove that right away. But if it's just kind of like the dead leftover plant from the year, leave it in. It'll help the bee shelter for some little guys. And then the best tip I have for you is to spend time in your garden. Okay, once again, no one's going to know your garden better than you. And you will only know your garden if you spend time in it. Um, so getting to know your garden when it's happy and healthy will help you know exactly when something is going wrong. And especially if you're spending lots of time in it, you may be able to catch like Japanese beetles being in there early or a diseased plant entering, right? Because only you are going to notice when these slight changes start happening. And if you're spending a lot of time in your garden, you can catch some of those become, before they become bigger problems. So that is most of my tips, or most of my tips for building your pollinator gardens. Um, there are other ways to get involved with pollinator health um, besides just building a garden, right? That doesn't seem as realistic for you after today. Um, but there are a lot of community science projects that are really important to um, pollinator health. Um, we've had mentioned Monarch Watch already, that program of tagging monarch butterflies so we understand their population a little better. Um, along with that, Monarch Larva Monitoring Project is an excellent community science project that focuses on finding um, the caterpillars and like understanding the population of caterpillars in the area. Um, Colorado Butterfly Monitoring Network is something that Butterfly Design is really involved in. We do a lot of trainings um, to help people identify Colorado butterflies, and then those people go out and record every time they see one of those butterflies on a walk and it helps us get some data about their populations. Great Sunflower Project is um, a big project where they basically just have people watch a sunflower for an hour and record what comes to visit that sunflower. It gives us a lot of information about what kinds of bees and other things are in that area. And along with that, the Bees and Weeds is a great project. They actually support you in like building a bee house for your garden. And then they just ask that you like kind of record what you see visit the bee house. So um, you can get some more data on what's actually living in those areas. So those are some of the things you can do. Um, those are all of the main things that I wanted to discuss with you today. Like I said, I would bring up my list of resources here. And, um, we can also chat about some of the other things. So there are those two plant guides as well as um, some of my other resources that I can share a little separately too if this um, isn't working as well. There's a native pollinators resource from um, 
Colorado, the Department of Agriculture in Colorado, as well as bumblebee identification and that noxious leaf list um, to understand what weeds you didn't know on your garden. Are there any questions overall as we wrap up here? And so if, if you're in person, I do have some wonderful examples of um, some of our specimens from our butterfly house, as well as um, like a beetle mites, I believe you can come and check that out more. Yeah. So if I wanted to plant it, plant, say, a sulfur flower, mm -hmm. where would I buy it? That's a great question. Um, you mostly want to reach out to nurseries um, that are like the areas of there. I think there's been a really big boom, especially recently, in nurseries providing native plants. And that's often why you want the um, species name instead of the common name of the flower. So if I provided both of those, because um, if you reach out to a nursery who does like native Colorado plants and give them the species name, um, then they'll know exactly what you're talking about and help them with them. Kind of flower bins in the long run. They're incredible. Yeah. Or like, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, this was great. Thank yeah, you. Of course. Of course. This is the track up here. <laughs> Not that far. <laughs> really good information for both groups. The Watershed Coalition understanding how these insects behave and their needs, and also in terms of planting our gardens. So, thank you for all the work you have to look at. Show. <laughs> If you are um, a member of the Wandering Wildlife Society, thank you for coming. If you're not a member and want to become one, we are selling memberships for $35 a piece and there is a discount for couples. If you, um, for the Garden Club, our next meeting is September. In <laughs> September. Second, second Monday of September. Second Monday of September. <clears throat> and that is going to be sort of a on the 12th. September 12th. Okay. Uh, that is going to be on biodiversity in our uh, Estes Park area. On biodiversity in Estes Park. And watch for <clears throat> The next um, Wandering Wildlife Society talk, as I said, it's going to be on bighorn sheep. And the person doing that is um, Chase Rylands, who works with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And he, he's really good. So check our website. I'm not sure the date. It's on a Thursday night. <clears throat> anyway, thank you for coming. I just had my daughter tell me the name of the spider. She was so really